show me. Can you see my uh, slide and just my slide? Not yet. Oh, here, let me stop sharing. Oh, wait, I'm not sharing. Okay. Can, how about now? Still not? Uh, no, no, still not quite yet. Let's see. So, uh, what am I forgetting? Do I need to do it? Do you yes, need there to should be a button that says share screen. Got that. Uh, let's see. So, how about <laughs> screen one? Good. Now you can ah, see. We're coming up. You. But you want, I want you to see that. And there we can, go. Can you just see just my slide? You can, right? Yes, sir. Just my cover slide. Okay. Good. Just your cover slide. I, see, I see nodding heads. All right, well, let's go ahead and get going. So good morning, everybody. It is, I am Jomo Stewart. I'm here with Mr. Burgraff. It is Tuesday, April 6th at roughly eight in the clock in the AM. Uh, we're here at the Energy for All Task Force, excuse me, Energy for All Alaska Task Force meeting of Tuesday, April 6th. Our guest today is Mr. Dan Robinson. He's the research chief for the Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development. He gave a presentation last week, as you can see from the slide, regarding Alaska's employment, wages, and population. Um, and I, I thought it'd be good information and follow up to Mr. Bittner's rundown as far as uh, how COVID impacted our small business sector, as well as a, uh, an upfront overview of the latest federal funding package. So, Mr. Robinson, if I may, I'll, I'll hand the floor to you. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see the fun. I like Clark's background. That's a, that's a scholar right there, all those books um, to go with the skier. I, uh, if if we, I'd had a little more time, and I'd be glad to either me or somebody from my team do this anytime you guys think it would be useful, but I would have done a little, uh, I'm rubbing my shoulder because I got my first shot yesterday, so that's subconscious. But um, so it's more Fairbank specific data. This data is almost all uh, statewide, a little bit of national, a little bit of regional. But I just wanted to to uh, put out that offer that anytime you uh, think uh, my shop here might be able to help you with uh, data in, in whatever decision making or planning you're doing, that's kind of an open invitation. If you're not at all familiar with us, um, we produce um, much of the basic um, economic data, social economic data, uh, employment wages, unemployment rates, population. We also work with AHFC on housing. Um, broadly, we're called the labor market information shop, but that's a little bit of a, of a wonky term that's not that helpful. Aside from producing a lot of this data, we also have a monthly publication called Alaska Economic Trends that I hope at least some of you are familiar with. That's our uh, monthly attempts to kind of extract insights that we think will be useful for policymakers, uh, business actors, anybody really interested in the economy. So, so that's basically who we are. Um, jumping right into it, as you see from the cover slide, the, most of the focus will be on COVID. And I was glad to hear that, that you'd talked to John uh, Bittner last week because, and some of this might be overlapping. I didn't see what John presented to you. Uh, but, and then as we go, if anybody has any questions, especially clarification questions, then let's see, I'll keep a rough eye on the chat. Um, okay, good, it's open for questions. And then, and then I think with our numbers, don't be shy about just uh, pop, you know, you know, raise, j just asking questions as we go. As I said, especially clarification questions, because if I put lines up that don't mean anything to you, then we're not uh, <laughs> doing anything useful here. So this first slide, what you see is uh, total wage and salary employment by month for the last four years. Um, I, I specifically did not want to zoom in because I want to, to make the point among a few other things that, uh, that a lot of jobs were affected by COVID, but a lot of jobs were not. Um, and even before that, I wanna just mention, look at 2018 and 2019, they're almost right on top of each other. That's fairly typical, whether we grow a little or shrink a little, 
there's not much variation year to year. We are a very seasonal economy uh, more than any other state. Our Janu but, but, but that too gets exaggerated. I think if, if you hear people talk casually about Alaska's economy, you'd probably think it's more seasonal than it is. Our January low point is, uh, goes up about 15%. The total number of jobs in July, our seasonal high point is about 15% higher than our annual low point in January. 15% is a lot, but, but again, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not like we don't do anything uh, except in the summer. Our seasonality, not surprisingly, you know this at least as well as I do, uh, some, summer tourism, construction, and uh, commercial fishing, uh, commercial and sport fishing. And Alaska is a little bit unusual. All of our seasonality is in the summer. A lot of states have uh, summer low points or offsetting. You think of uh, Colorado, they have winter high points. Fairbanks is interesting because Fairbanks does have a little bit of winter tourism. It, it's, it's tiny compared to summer tourism, um, of course, or as you know. Um, and then, and then the other thing. Notice here when we get to April, uh, March, and then really April of 2020. That's when the COVID impact hits, and that's a big drop, 14% uh, roughly. And then, and then you see 2020 roughly tracks. We we missed that whole summer uh, normal busy season, not all of it, but most of it. You still see a little bit of an up uptick. And then we're back around to February and we're still uh, well below year ago levels. The, the biggest, uh, the, the, we produce these numbers by industry as well. And the biggest um, areas of losses through February are uh, leisure and hospitality. So that's uh, restaurants, bars, gyms, uh, performing arts centers, things like that, um, by far the biggest. Um, those jobs don't pay a lot, so that's something to keep in mind. The other, the next biggest numerically and by percentage is oil and gas, and we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more detail in a minute. But oil and gas <laughs> is not low paying. Uh, oil, oil and gas jobs in Alaska, uh, most recent quarter annualized, about 160 grand a year for each of those jobs, and we're down about what. Uh, roughly 3,000, 4,000 almost from year ago levels. So that's, uh, and, and again, we'll come back to that because that's uh, outsized, of about size importance in Alaska. Um, so moving on. Now this, this slide, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a uh, colored spaghetti slide, um, but this is the same, well, and, and then I just wanna make one more point here. Well, no, no, we'll come back to that. Uh, so this is looking at Alaska's six economic regions. So uh, interior is Fairbanks, um, Southeast Fairbanks, Denali. Um, Fairbanks dominates those numbers. Um, but looking at, at the interior specifically, the light blue line, um, you can see that your, your the, 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 the drop initially is roughly the same for all regions, Southeast being the exception because Southeast uh, depends on summer cruise ship tourism more than the other parts of the state. Denali would be up there, but Denali, Fairbanks has more diversity than, than Southeast. Um, and then Fairbanks bounces back fairly well. When I say bounces back, when we get into the winter months, you're not as far below year ago as you were in the summer. Uh, and then you, you're a little bit better off uh, than, than Southeast still. And, and there are lots of details in there that, that I, won't, I, won't, uh, I won't bother with now, but do note again, the difference between all the other regions and the Northern region. The Northern region is uh, Nome, Northwest Arctic and North Slope Borough. Um, what's, what's going on there is quite specifically oil and gas loss of jobs. We had 15,000, almost 16,000 oil and gas jobs seven or eight years ago during our three-year economic recession from 2015 to 2018, we dropped down to about 9,000. We were just getting them back. We had climbed up to about 10,000 before this, uh, before COVID hit. And then we dropped below 7,000 
um, we're at about 6,300 now. And, and interestingly, and, and maybe a little bit worryingly, there is no sign yet of a return of oil and gas jobs. They may just be delayed, but, but unlike other parts of the economy, we're not seeing those numbers bounce back. And as I said, they're, they're, they're still way down. They, almost undoubtedly, they will bounce back to a degree. How, how you know, whether all the way back is a, is a harder question. Um, so it, this next one, just you get a quick comparison with the US economy. Uh, one point to make here is that the, the COVID impact, the initial impact was about the same in Alaska as it was in the US in terms of the percentage of jobs lost. And that's true of, of almost all the states. Uh, there were a few, that there, there are definitely a few that have recovered faster. I, Idaho is back above year ago levels already. Um, but the initial drop, the, the, the shutdown, the uh, everybody work from home, that was pretty similar across the country. Um, the uh, other thing to note with this slide is that pre-COVID, we were underperforming a little bit relative to the rest of the country. And, and I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about that. Alaska historically, in terms of job growth and population growth has outperformed the rest of the country. Part of that because we're a young state and we had a lot happening. A big part of that is because of uh, the oil wealth in the eighties that, that it really, it, it was massive for a state with a small population. And that, that kind of juiced our economy for a lot of years. That's, there, there's some interesting new questions, both about oil and also about as, as if you pay any attention to what's happening in the state legislature, um, what, how we're going to fund state government, how much state government we're going to have. Um, some of these new questions that again, relate a little bit to us being a young state other states, uh, most of them, have had decided for decades, in some cases, a hundred more years, how they're going to fund their basic state government. Alaska had one approach before oil. We've had a different approach since oil. And now we're moving into this new phase uh, that is proving very challenging politically. And it's not helping our economy, all this uncertainty and instability as we go through that. Uh, so moving to wages specifically, and this is, these are wages uh, for wage and salary jobs. This does not include self-employed income, but if you get a check from an employer, you're included in this data. And again, I, I wanted to include zero because I didn't want to exaggerate the, the loss uh, that COVID created. They were big, but, but I think we tend to uh, exaggerate the movement in these big economic data sets. That's true of employment, that's true of population, that's true of wages, personal income. Um, it's a big, slow moving battleship for the most part. And, and the, the, the underlying fundamentals, um, even, even during a pandemic, uh, don't change as much as, as, as maybe people would assume they do. So you see, for example, we go from quarter two, 2019 to quarter two, 2020, the second, the second set of bars, and you see a, a meaningful decrease in total wages paid, $174 million, and then an even bigger increase in third quarter. That's as current as we have for wages. Um, so, and, and I'm, that, that leads me to this very next point that, that <laughs> and, and that wages fell. There's, and the economy got whacked pretty hard in terms of jobs lost and wages not paid. Uh, but this earnings from employment and, and wages are, in, are part of that earnings from employment. They're not all, but this, this is from a different, um, it's from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. They include the wage data, but they also add in self-employment income um, and, and some, some other things, uh, the amount that you receive from your employer for, for health insurance and, and pensions, for example. But just think of that roughly as the amount you get from work. And then you have this second series of bars, that's dividends, interest, and rent. If you're a landlord, 
if you're a great investor, if you, uh, you know, that's, think of that roughly as investment income. And, and, and one point that, that uh, I'll make is Alaska's permanent fund dividends are not included in dividends, interest, and rent. They're considered a transfer receipt. Transfer receipts are basically money you get from the government, from a government, uh, for which you did no current work. So that would include um, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, and 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 definition definitional kind of uh, nuances aside. The more important point here is look how much bigger the increase in transfer receipts are than the decrease in earnings from employment. So quite counterintuitively, total personal income, and, and these three th things combined are personal income, total personal income increased in 2020. So the, 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 the government programs, the, the extra unemployment insurance, the small business assistance, PPP, all those things combined were much bigger than the loss to the economy from employment and wages. And, and the, the, there's some policy reasons for that that, that I don't, won't get into and won't weigh in on. We, we're policy neutral. The, 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 the effort obviously is to prevent other kinds of economic harm that would, that would, be, that would be longer lasting. And, and we'll see how that all plays out. But, uh, but it, whether or not this money is getting to all the right people is a fair question. But, but at the aggregate for this, the economy as a whole, um, 2020 was actually an up year, which is, you know, again, fascinating. So moving to population, and uh, Alaska is, is <laughs> incredibly interesting. Um, we've, we've got a, a fascinating uh, pre-European contact history. That's one of the reasons I put up this, uh, this document that we did a few years ago, a history of Alaska population settlement. It, um, it kind of charts that. Uh, interesting history, including uh, Alaska native groups or native groups pre-contact population estimates. Um, we've got the gold rush era, uh, which is which is also very interesting, a population spike early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And then you can see when we move into the era, the, the time period that I show on this graph, uh, the, the, the just after World, World War II, um, World War II, was a, was a huge factor in Alaska's development um, in, in Anchorage and Fairbanks, particularly uh, before, before, I'm trying to think how late it was, but Southeast Alaska was the population center of Alaska until I think roughly World War II, but Anchorage and Fairbanks um, grew much faster and, and Southeast has never, has never caught up. Um, it, I think it's, it's quite interesting that it, post World War II, the Cold War buildup, Alaska had a lot of uh, population growth. Um, and you, that's what you see in the, the 19, you know, 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. You can see moving into the 70s, pipeline construction, and then a little bit of, of, uh, of a give back of that, some of that population growth. If we showed jobs, the spike here in the 70s would be much bigger. Um, it's sometimes, uh, we do a little, what, subtle myth busting sometimes. Sometimes people say uh, outsiders came to Alaska and built our pipeline and then went home. And there's, there's, there's a little bit of truth to that. We had to import a whole lot of labor to build the pipeline, massive project. But a lot of those people stayed. Um, so they became Alaskans. Uh, the 80s were, were a little bit more of a boom bust, a true boom bust. Um, we, we were swimming in oil money, uh, early 80s, and, and the growth was very strong. Not, oh, I guess coincidentally, the US economy was, was doing terribly in the early 80s, bad recession. So Alaska looked pretty promising um, to a lot of people, and we got, we got strong population growth, early 80s, then we get the, the, uh, the Alaska's worst recession, uh, late 80s, uh, and we, we lose some population, we lose a lot of jobs. Um, and then we've had, a, until our current period, which I'm gonna talk about next, we had a long, slow, uh, uh, steady growth trend, growth pattern that kind of belied Alaska's 
boom and bust reputation. Um, there were a couple of US recessions in that period uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s that didn't touch Alaska. We just grew right through them. And, and our resources were the, were the basic reason for that, mostly oil. So, and I think this is my, it is my second to last slide. And, and this is, this is uh, uh, this pattern that you see here. First, let me just say what it is. This is, uh, this is net migration. So this is the, the number of people who move to Alaska minus the number of people who move away from Alaska. If it's positive, more people are coming than going. If it's, if it's negative, if it's the red bars, more people are leaving than coming. And uh, prior to this current period, we've never had a period with more than four years of negative net migration. Plenty of Alaskans would say so, I mean, and understandably and not wrongly, who cares about population growth? Why do we need to grow? So the point here is not to say that growth is necessarily good and not growing is necessarily bad, but, but healthy, thriving economies do tend to grow. Um, economies that are consistently losing people uh, are, are, are generally not healthy, uh, are relatively less healthy. So again, take note of the fact that in our other downturns, never more than four consecutive years did we, had, did we have more people leaving Alaska than moving to Alaska. These numbers are not particularly big in single year increments. It's more the pattern um, of the eight consecutive years. Uh, and, and by employment growth too, we would lag most other states over this period. So something is not going really well in the Alaska economy right now relative to our history and relative to other states. One of those things is quite clear, the oil's uh, struggles and, 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 and it may be coming back, but that's part of what's driven this, uh, this pattern and the, the lower job growth. But it's not all of it. This other thing is, is uh, this, this, these growing pains as we figure out uh, the dividend, whether we're going to pay taxes, how much state government we're going to have, um, uncertainty for, if you think of the university, K-12, the ferry system, lots of things are getting, getting shaken up right now that, that affect the, uh, the desirability of living in Alaska. Some people might say, I'm not, I, it doesn't feel like, a, like a, a secure enough place right now. I'm going to just stay put or I'm going to go try my fortune somewhere else. This, this, this uh, last chart that I'll show you is uh, to make the point that, that although there's been a little bit of storytelling, not wrongly, about uh, you know, this university professor who uh, left Alaska because he didn't want to have to worry about his, his or her job every year, or a, or a teacher, or a, a young parent, or I mean, those things may be true, but the out of Alaska uh, has is not what's increased to drive the negative net migration as much as the into Alaska has decreased. You see, going back to 2013, the last time we had positive net migration, we actually had more people leave Alaska that year than we did in recent years. But the real difference between then and now is the big decrease in people moving to Alaska. Um, and again, I don't want to put too fine a point on this because this is not, a, not necessarily a problem in itself. Uh, what, it, what it says is that we are, we are less desirable to people who either want to stay or might consider coming here than we have been historically. And that raises additional questions as opposed to, uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't look to even these bars for the sake of that. We should, we should ask ourselves what's happening why aren't people coming to Alaska? And, and, and we've already talked about the two basic reasons. Um, and there's a lot more behind that, of course, in, including a fair amount of uncertainty. But, but that's my last slide. And I would be more than happy to either answer questions or if there are data points that you, you, know, you say, I'd, I'd love to see that from Fairbanks or whatever else. Um, I, I don't mind at all making a list of, of uh, resources I could point you to uh, that kind of thing. All right. Well, this is a great moment for a pause, and we're right at the bottom of the hour. Um, 
So just for you, Mr. Robinson, I do have pulled up right now the research section of the Department of Labor website. Um, in case you want to, you know, need that as a reference. But I would open the floor uh, to the participants. Do we have any questions? I'd be shocked if we don't. Please just go ahead and take yourselves off mute if you do. Mr. Dawson? Dan, uh, on the transfer payments that you represented on one of your slides, that includes uh, things like Social Security and, and, and and money from the federal government and state government. Correct, correct. And, and it's interesting, Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, I, I was curious if those had gone up. They were about flat over that period. It was, it was mostly the extra money in unemployment insurance payments and then this broad category called other, which was where the payroll protection plan and some of the small business assistance, maybe the rental and mortgage assistance. But, but yes, that would include um, all of those payments. And the, the, the key concept is for which you received, you did no current work. Thank you. So it sounds like, again, we, we had some pretty acute pain um, over the course of this in the economy, but it was, it was fairly localized by certain job classifications and of course, uh, across certain regions. Yeah, for sure. And, and I've, some of our economists and some other people doing this kind of work have called this a recession and it meets all the all the basic criteria but to me it's 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 a little bit the wrong word it, it's it, it's a pandemic and and that's important partly because the the job losses were so specific um and tied to uh trying to get the pandemic under control and all those things and and on the on the positive side, on the other side of that, normally a recession kind of, it, it shakes up our financial sector. Uh, housing markets quite often get affected, but we, we, could, we could conceivably uh, in Alaska, but even more so the country kind of roar out of this. You've heard the phrase, it's almost a cliche already, pent up demand. Like a lot of us, remember I said at, at the worst 14% job loss we're, we're now down we're about seven percent so 93 out of 100 of us were working through what not uh, were, uh, have jobs and probably had jobs throughout the pandemic meanwhile we couldn't spend the kind of money on travel and some other things that we could have uh so so the housing market is solid uh we we could and, and our, alaska's got this problem of, of another another rough summer uh, tourism season ahead of us. But, but after that, there, there are lots of reasons to think that we'll come out of this uh, downturn much, much stronger than, we would, than a normal uh, recession recovery. Certainly that seemed to be the hope of a lot of the funders, federal and state. Sir, Mr. Dotson. Uh, Dan, uh, one of the presentations by ICE, or, uh, um, you see, Gatabi, I think, uh, talked about you know, the, the lack of, of kind of base industry in Alaska, you know, the diversity, uh, uh, lack of diversity, probably uh, only relying on a few industries like oil and gas that, uh, you know, that probably will continue to suffer in Alaska. But uh, uh, it's going to be a problem when we try to, when we start get in a position to build back our economy. Uh, you know, we just don't have a lot of places to go to, to create jobs. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, Musin talks about, uh, you know, the, the, the likelihood of a, of, a, of a slow recovery because of a lack of a catalyst for growth is, is kind of the term he uses, which is, is interesting. Um, the, and, and backing up just a little bit, it, it's, it's useful to, when you think about an economy, to think about what we sometimes call basic sectors or economic drivers. And those are the things that we, that we sell or offer to the outside world that then bring money into our economy to circulate here. So in Alaska, in rough order, federal government, right? And that includes the military, huge factor in our economy. Oil and gas would still be a solid second biggest and if you go back some years, oil and gas would have been 
about the same size as federal government. But those are by far the two biggest. Then you've got uh, commercial fishing and tourism, roughly the same size. Both sides argue that they're bigger than the other one. <laughs> we get a chuckle out of that. But they're both big and important in Alaska. Um, those two things are world class in terms of things to, to bring money into an economy. Alaska has always been a fantastic place for people to come and visit. We, we, we cash that check in abundance and commercial fishing. We're also world class. Um, and, then, and then a little smaller than that, you've got other mining. You've got our, and, and that's kind of rich with potential. Alaska is mineral wealthy and we've got massive land mass that's part of it. We're infrastructure poor which is a, is a challenge. When I say that, I mean, that's I'm using a lot of words for, we can't always get roads to where the minerals are, um, but Alaska has the minerals that the world not only needed historically, but will need going forward. And then you've got a, a hodgepodge of smaller things. And, and in that, I would include things like air cargo and Anchorage. Um, that's not just moving stuff around Alaska, that's an international stopping point and that generates some wealth. So, so those are kind of our core, um, what, economic um, uh, foundations. Alaska, and they're, they're big, and, and we could, one of the other things Musin talks about, and I completely agree, we could, we, could, we could work to benefit more from some of those things. A lot of the wealth that's generated here does not stay here. Uh, and some of that's because we're far from markets and other things like that. But, but as an economy going into the future, there's a lot to like about, about Alaska in terms of, you know, imagine if you were, uh, West Virginia has struggled for a lot of years, uh, the combination of coal and some other things. Alaska is not in that category. Um, so I, I don't, I, I think in, in the short term, COVID is going to be our focus. Um, we also need to focus on getting this, this state government thing figured out so that we don't accidentally uh, degrade our institutions, become a place that doesn't, that doesn't uh, communicate stability and, and, and solid decision-making uh, because it matters the quality of your schools, it matters the public safety, some of those things that state government, uh, state government does. Um, so that's too long of an answer, but, but I don't worry a lot short-term about this lack of a catalyst for growth. COVID will come out of that. Um, some of the other problems we take care of. And then oil is, what happens with oil is largely out of our hands, but that's gonna have a big impact on you know, the next decade and, and really the next several decades, how strong we grow. Sure, and then I think we'll get Mr. Hall. Yeah, uh, Dan, um, I don't know if you've noticed, seen the work uh, that Nolan Crada has been doing on um, it's actually on supply chain mapping, but you know the statistics uh, that uh, Nolan has generated in that effort uh, indicate that 31% of the jobs in the interior uh, of, of, of private sector jobs in the interior are uh, as a result of, of military and military growth. And then statewide, I think that number is more like 11%. Uh, of, of the statewide jobs. The interesting thing to me, it, it, it always has been, is that the Department of Labor seems to uh, be stuck on this model that does not include military uh, as employment. And so, you know, when I think about it, I always wonder, well, are we really <clears throat> reflecting our true economy? Because our economy is so, is so hugely driven by, the, by that one, let me call it an in industry. Uh, could you tell me kind of the state thinking and maybe how other states handle that same situation? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because it, if you talk about an important sector in Fairbanks, military is, is I mean, it, just population, active duty military and dependents are about 20% of your total population. That's, that's off the charts important to an economy. We we do, we try to remind people often that the active duty military uh, numbers are not in our employment data sets. We, we probably should do it more, but, but, but Alaska is like every other state and the federal, the federal statistical agencies in treating the military entirely separately. So 
you won't, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is our federal partner. So you, you could not find military numbers in any of those data sets for employment. It's all of us should remind each other, especially in states like Alaska, where the military is so important. And, and we, we try to note this on our tables and things that this does not include the active duty military. But the, you're, you're right that it's a big part of the economy. Um, our population um, unit here, our demographers, um, work uh, with the military to get uh, not just active duty numbers, but dependent numbers. We call them group quarters. So uh, with all of your uh, uh, F-35 and other act military activity in the area, there's been a lot of housing impact. Um, so you're, there's no question the military is an important part of the economy. Um, and and, and self-employment's another one. There are some other important pieces of the economy that don't show up in these standard data sets. And, and we try to remind ourselves of that, like I said, but we, we could always do it more. Specific to the military, and, and I'm sorry, Mr. Hall, if you, you're, you're next. Is there something we could do, at least on the state level, um, to better quantify and, and use those statistics? By the way, I love your matching flannels, Clark. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you're for those of you who've been around for very long, you, you know this, the, the BRAC a couple of times, the base realignment and closure activity, uh, I mean, uh, Ileson, let's see, it was Ileson. It was on the chopping block, wasn't it? Um, so it was, it was really impressive to me how the state, including uh, Anchorage Economic Development uh, Corporation and others said, no, no, we can't, <laughs> whatever we can do to keep the military strong and, and here really matters. I, I don't, I mean, obviously the congressional delegation would play a role in that. I, I suspect that it, in the end, the decisions, we, we wouldn't have a ton of influence over them, um, but it certainly doesn't hurt to uh, be aware of how important they are and, and sometimes how invisible they are, including in Anchorage. I mean, Joint Base, it, they, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're away from some of the common stuff. And you, so you don't, from, from, the, from the downtown economy and some of those other things, so we don't see them enough. So just <laughs> identifying them as an important piece of our economy when we have these kinds of conversations helps. But we shouldn't kid ourselves that we have a whole lot of power over what happens. Uh, F-35s, that's, that's global military stuff that at best our congressional delegation can, can help a little bit with. Mr. Hall? Uh, yeah, thank you. It, interesting information. And uh, I, I don't think it can be understated how important it is for the state to identify how they're going to fund the economy going further. But I was wondering, uh, in the in and out of your net migrations, uh, looking through the screen here, I see a lot of thinning gray hair. Do you have any information or what is the information on the demographics of who's leaving, who's coming on into the state? In order to build the economy, it seems we want a workforce age group to be interested in Alaska. Yeah, oh, I love that question. And if I, if I was a little more sure of my uh, ability to do this without bumbling, I'd show you a graph. Um, I'm, I'm talking to a committee in a couple of days and one of the, and I'll show this graph there. Historically, Alaska has had, and when I say historically, we'll, we'll say the, 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 the time period after the 80s. Um, some of the things I'll say will be true before that, but that's a little bit of a muddy time because we had such big in and out migration. But, but historically, the age group that we are most appealing to, this won't surprise you, uh, 25 to 29 year olds. We consistently, and we still, even in this period when we're, when we're losing migration, we're still getting more 25 to 29 year olds moving here than moving away. We, we have consistently gained uh, K-12 population of uh, uh, age groups. We, we, we consistently gained through to about uh, late 30s. Um, then uh, when you get into the older ages, we consist and we, we've always lost. Alaska's never going to be a retirement haven, right? There, there are plenty of us that are going to stay because it's home. 
but we're, we're always, we always have and, and likely always will give away more of our seniors than, than we will attract from other states. And that we kind of live with, I think. Um, it, it's, to me, it's quite interesting and useful and, and healthy for an economy to attract those uh, late 20s, early 30s group. Those are, those are uh, prime working age or early working age people. Uh, another uh, little pattern there that, that Alaska's never done great with is the 15 to 19 age group. We've always been a net exporter of that age group. Some you've heard brain drain probably. Whether or not the ones leaving are the smart ones, you know, is open for debate. But but we, we unlike Massachusetts, for example, Massachusetts, North Carolina, California, probably, they would import kind of college age young adults into their economies to attend university, whatever else. Alaska's always lost more of those people. That to me looks a little bit like a problem. But, but, it's, but it's been consistent. So it, it's one of the reasons uh, cuts to the university to me are a little problematic. We, we, we had, and, and UAF would be a little bit of an exception to this, we had a young university and now it's getting kind of pounded. Um, so we, we took a, a something that wasn't yet strong. And again, UAF has some programs that would be the exception to this. Uh, but, but that 15 to 19, we've always sent more, more Alaskans have left to, to seek their education and training outside of Alaska than we've imported in for, for across the board. All of those with the exception of 25 to 29 have been negative over, the, over that eight year period when we've lost migration. And, and, right. and just to Please. follow up, just in the March issue of Trends, we wrote about that specific issue in a lot of detail. So if you, if you just Googled Alaska economic trends in March issue, it would, it would pop up. A lot of, I think, fascinating information on age-based migration to and from Alaska. Speaking of the trends. Yeah. Yep. The, and it's the, the issue right before that, April or, or uh, March. Yep. If you click there, Jomo. Yep, exactly. And just scroll down. Yep, there it is. And I'll, I'll give you a shameless plug, sir. Uh, <laughs> yes, for the, for the record, for the recording, again, there's an enormous amount of data on the Department of Labor website. Uh, the Trends Magazine is actually one of the go-to resources we use here, obviously, at the Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation. Um, we actually were mining some of your own issues for a presentation we were giving to the Assembly uh, a couple of weeks ago. And you had some of that, uh, really, we were looking at some of the pre-COVID economic and employment data. And then a little further that. down, I will just show, you know, I don't want to steal your thunder, boss. No, but under ahead. the research tab, no, there you go, sir. Yeah. Census data, yeah, please. Well, I was just going to say, uh, and I, I Joan, we talked about this. I should have practiced a little more. Just I, I uh, the you were going to say population and census, so all kinds of detail there, clear down to the place level, and then under labor market information, if you click on that. And then the, the one the thing I wanted to show you here. Look, click on quarterly census of employment and wages, the one at the bottom. And this is where we have, and then just maybe grab quarterly, the top one, the top of July to September. This is where we have the most detail for employment and wages for the, for the boroughs and census areas. And if you scroll down, it, it's just alphabetical. So we grab that to the right and go down quite a bit. And let's just take a quick look at Fairbanks. This is data that comes to us. Uh, it, employers have to report it under state unemployment insurance law. So it's Oops. it's not a guess. It it's, should be quite accurate. There we um, go. Fairbanks. Yeah, you had it. There you go. So there you can see the your July, August, and September employment and the amount of wage. So $515 million went out in total in third quarter. Um, and then all the detail below.
for, for industries. Okay. Did, uh, you're right. Did you have a question? Uriah? No, I don't have a question. I'm just taking little notes here. <laughs> I see a question in the quote about migration numbers include military transfers. Yes, they do. So it, this is, I hope one of the things you remember is our population numbers fully include the military. That's a challenging task because of deployments and some other things. And there's some really legitimate questions. And, and, and the military is understandably a little uh, less willing to provide information than some other sectors of the economy. But our population numbers, migration numbers, military is fully included in that. So what Dan, Please Dan, I was a little astonished to see that the, the migration outwards is around 40,000 plus a year. That's so I'm doing math on my fingers here, but that's like that's greater than 5% of the state's population every year, year in, year out. Is that is that exceptional or is that typical? It is it is exceptional. And so to, it's, it's exceptional among states. So those migration flows are comfortably bigger than any other state. We have this strong pull to Alaska and the military is part of this, but, but, but not all of it. And then, and then people can't, can't or decide they don't want to stay. So, but yes, our mar migration flows are, are the biggest among states. The, that, that percentage of the total, I'd have to check this, but it's, it's roughly, it's, it's, it's not out of the ordinary by our historical standards. We've always had that big in and that big out. Sometimes people in doing that math, they'll say, well, that might means our total population uh, cycles through. That's not what happens. What happens much more likely, and we've, we've tested this a few different ways, a lot of the newer people who come are also the ones who leave. Dan, one of the things that you talked about uh, as, you, as you were talking about industry is being able to retain more of the money or wealth, I guess, that's generated in Alaska, retained it in Alaska. And, and, you know, to me, that's always kind of been a cornerstone of building Alaska's economy because we have, you know, even in the fishing industry and, and, and other industries, you know, huge leaks in our economy. One of the things I talked about earlier was the, the, uh, the, the study that uh, Nolan's doing uh, uh, which uh, really is designed to marry up uh, military purchases in the state with, with uh, suppliers in the state. And, and to me, uh, I'm really anxious to see that study and, and, uh, and, and be able, able, to, able to apply it because uh, huge dollars are being spent today by the military in the state. And, you know, at least from my perspective, as I look at, you know, their uh, renewed interest in the Arctic, there's going to be huge infrastructure dollars and and research dollars uh, spent in the future and and how we take advantage of that is is really important. So um, one of the things you talked about is uh, difficulty getting statistical information from the military. I think that's going to improve. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, uh, more cooperation with the military and, and the state and and. And researchers, so that uh, not only uh, are are they you know kind of wanting to know their impact, but they're also you know they're also uh, wanting to share their numbers more. Yeah, that those relationships we try to nurture and uh, be, because they're important, and once they know how we use them, they tend to trust us, and we don't blame them at all for being a little uh, what. Uh, they, keeping keeping things close unless they are sure how they're going to be used and things like that. But but to your first point, um, I mean, one, um, Nolan's a nice economic asset for us. He's doing a lot of great work. Moussin, Iser, a lot of good thinking going on. One of the things they're saying that I think is 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 a lesson that Alaska should learn <laughs> is it, it, Moussin says this too is is benefiting more from what we already have probably pays more dividends than swing for the fences for something that the market has, for whatever reason, decided isn't right for Alaska. 
think of how small our population is. Think of how far away we are from markets. There are some things here that we've tried to make happen that never made any sense. On the other hand, I mean, th that, that's such a fascinating idea, tapping into more of that big, big military spending, <laughs> commercial fishing, oil and gas. And tourism is kind of interesting because it's more of a service. So I don't think we have as much of a problem there. Although even there, there's a lot of money being made in Alaska on, on summer visitors that is, that is going outside. And not all of that's bad. We don't want to get too protective and, and, and you know, suggest that we can be in a, a weird little island economy. But there are things big happening with the Arctic, with the, with, with, I mean, the military is interesting. I think we're just strategically important. So that seems like something likely to be stable or growing. So I just love that thought. It seems way more, uh, more promising. Let's benefit more from what we have instead of throwing money at these things that we don't have. Take it out of FEDC's playbook. <laughs> All right. Well, we are nearing the top of the hour. Uh, we do have a couple of more minutes, though. Do we have any further questions? Clark? Mr. Sackett? And I'm not sure who the uh, 9822, wait, 9826931. Clark, I see you took yourself off mute, or excuse me, put your camera on. I was wondering if uh, you'd mentioned students and the age group there where the uh, upper teens and after they graduate, go off to school, they disappear. As you probably remember, uh, the university did its best. And I'm trying to think of the general's name. All I'm getting in my mind is a G. The past uh, chancellor did a excellent job, you know, with scholarships and such. Is that visible in the data too? You know, that would be a bulb, a, a jump somewhere in the late 80s or something. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at the 80s. I, I wonder, Clark, if you were going to talk about the performance scholarship. The, there were a couple of scholarships that that I, and, and the answer to your question, at least with this more modern period, is no, it's, it wasn't a big enough factor to leave marks in the data. But to me, it seems really smart to, to figure out how to keep, especially our high achievers, by, I mean, that's a win. Um, and it, at whatever it costs, I suspect is, is more than paid back. The numbers tend to be small. I mean, we could go big. Some states have done things like say, free community college or something, just to, to say, we, it's so obvious that, that getting more uh, and better trained young people in the pipeline makes sense. But the 80s thing, I'm gonna scribble a note because I, I'm not, familiar with the changes that were made then. I'd heard from the chancellor here uh, that the, the, the budget cutting in the late 80s took them decades to come back from. Because you know it's, it's not necessarily wrong to cut, but if we cut sloppily, <laughs> it takes a long time for institutions to come back from that. And the, the chancellor's point was, we cut sloppily in the 80s. And that, that hurt. He was talking about UAS in particular, which is smaller and less important to the state by far. UAF and, U, and UAA are where the, 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 the big numbers are. But, uh, but to me, that just seems like a smart thing to do to try to reduce the, the loss of some of those students, especially the, the good students. Well, Mr. Robinson, thank you so much. Uh, very much appreciate the presentation. And yes, I think we will be circling back around. Um, certainly as we move through, uh, yeah, as we move through 2021, we see how the summer season is starting to come together. Um, and it'd be interesting to see when does that data come out for say fourth quarter of 2020? Yeah, there's about a five or six month lag. Um, the, the monthly job numbers for the, for, for the region come out every month. We do a monthly press release, roughly the third Friday of the month. But the more detailed data that we look briefly at, uh, it has about a five, four, five, six month delay. All right. Well, then we, we will be circling around. And if I may ask you one more question. So you say you have one more presentation pending. Uh, what's our committee and, and what day? It's, uh, it's this House Ways and Means Committee. And it's on uh, Thursday. I think 11 o'clock. 
And it's kind of odd because I have a, a strange 90 minute window. So I, I'm trying to figure out still, I'll be doing this all day, kind of what's <laughs> most, what I think will be most useful. Their three charges are figure out new revenue, figure out how to make go state government more efficient and figure out how to restrain government growth. Stop the leaks. <laughs> well, we, we seem to be doing a fairly good job of restraining government growth of late <laughs> in the I last might, five or six years. I might show them some data to make that exact point. <laughs> Okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Again, Mr. Robinson, thank you very much. So we'll be looking on Thursday for the House Ways and Means Committee for the latest presentation from Department of Labor. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm not sure exactly what we might have next week. So I'll, I will be circling around with the group. Otherwise, just have a great remainder of the week. Stay warm, everybody, and try to get those roofs cleared. Thank you, Jomo, Jim, Roger. Bye-bye. Oh, that's good.